Monsieur le Secretary General of the United Nations, President of the Council of State, Director General of the United Nations here in Geneva, former presidents of the Swiss Confederation Excellencies, members of the Geneva Parliament, former Council of State, ladies and gentlemen in charge of organizations, international organizations, colleagues, students, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Secretary General, we are honored and deeply grateful indeed that you have chosen to speak to us at university, our university. You have thus chosen a place of research, of training, and first and foremost, a place of dialogue and openness, a real symbol. In our societies where cultures are in daily contact through globalization, migration, and instant exchange of information, dialogue between these cultures is more necessary than ever before. Dialogue is a vector of societal innovation. Dialogue is what enables us to strive towards mutual understanding between different ways of thinking, feeling, believing, legislating, dreaming, and doing. To quote Denis de Rougemont on cultures in the broader sense of the word. To learn to know and understand one another, ladies and gentlemen, to contain, so as to contain ignorance, fear, hostility, and frustration worldwide is the objective of a real dialogue amongst cultures which we aspire to and it is a prerequisite for any enlightened peace and security policy. Universities and our university in particular, your university, work hard to create and pass on knowledge to facilitate understanding of otherness of alterity by analyzing and interpreting human behavior throughout history and today. Our universities take part in this necessary dialogue between cultures and provide future generations with the tools that make this dialogue possible and meaningful. Mr. Secretary General, you are going to present to us your disarmament agenda to counter the deterioration of international security and you will then exchange with our students on this matter. Your initiative, Secretary General, is fundamental indeed. It is of the highest importance for our world and for the future of our world, and obviously we will listen to you very attentively indeed, and our students will pay particular attention to what you have to say because they are the architects of the world of tomorrow. Thank you. I now have the pleasure of giving the floor to the President of the Council of State, Mr. François Longchamp. Please come to the speaker's days. Thank you for listening. Monsieur le Secret Mr. Secretary General of the United Nations, Madam Former President of the Swiss Confederation, Mr. Rector of the University of Geneva, Mr. Director General of the Office of the United Nations, ladies and gentlemen, professors, ladies and gentlemen, and in particular, dear students. The United Nations Charter claims that states are resolved to state their beliefs in fundamental human rights. I know, Madam that you prefer to say les droits de l'homme in French, but now we say droits humains, human rights. But let's talk about what is human. The United Nations Charters is a vision. It doesn't state specifically anything to do with state of war or peace. It says that to ensure stability, we need to achieve social progress. We make about it in many ways indeed, but there's only one way forward, dialogue amongst peoples and cultures. The University of Geneva finds this a very important topic. It's very close to our heart. The alma mater uh, is 
in Geneva a wide diaspora. We have more foreigners here in Geneva than in the capital city of Switzerland, uh, given the international organizations. And we host more international conferences than in New York. So it's wonderful indeed that the Secretary General of the United Nations has decided to make an announcement here today. The Alma Mater is the nourishing earth. This is what Bologna was about already in the 11th century. It is the mission and the concern of the United Nations. It is Mother Earth as far as peace, security, and a certain vision of human organization are concerned. The Secretary General of the United Nations, you are familiar with this city. You worked here as a High Commissioner for Refugees. You have many friends indeed in the city. Geneva and the United Nations are at peace with one another in symbiosis over the last five years. We have more uh, projects that have been developed in the in international uh, city, and we will have many more projects that will be developed in this, in this city. Michael Muller has uh, worked very hard to make the people of Geneva to make them understand what the United Nations is about and to help the United Nations General Assembly understand what is the role played by Geneva and Switzerland. We in Geneva have tremendous respect for the United Nations because of this very friendly cooperation we have been able to develop together. Uh, Secretary General, you are a man of action. You have been appointed at the highest posts in Portugal before you joined the United Nations. You know that we need a framework to achieve the impossible. The framework is here. You are at home in Geneva because Geneva enjoys having you here and because the world is in Geneva. We're very happy indeed to hear what you have to say. Monsieur le Président du Conseil d'État. Mr. Council, President of State, thank you, sir. Thank you for your support to International Geneva and our university. Without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to Mr. Gutierrez. We're waiting with bated breath to hear what you have to say, sir. Chers étudiants, Monsieur le Recteur. Uh... Dear students, Director, members of the university, members of the Council of State, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for this very warm welcome. Thank you for your kind words. Obviously, I'm very happy uh, to be back here in Geneva. Pleasure to be here with you today to focus on a subject of great global anxiety, the threat posed by weapons of all kinds. I wanted to launch my disarmament agenda here in Geneva, the city of peace, diplomacy, and humanitarian action, home to a community of peacemaking institutions where many conflicts have been prevented and resolved. I thank the University of Geneva for generously hosting us. In the past few weeks and months, arms control has been in the news every day sometimes in relation to Iran and Syria, sometimes the Korean Peninsula. Let me say a few brief words on these recent developments. I am deeply concerned by the cancellation of the planned meeting in Singapore between the President of the United States and the leader of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. And I urge the parties to continue their dialogue to find a path to the peaceful and verifiable denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. And I welcome all actions by the European Union and others to work with Iran to preserve the joint comprehensive plan of action. But the disarmament agenda I'm launching today goes beyond nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction. Disarmament con concerns every country and all weapons from hand grenades to hydrogen bombs. 
Deadly weapons put us all at risk. And leaders have a responsibility to minimize that risk. The paradox is that when each country pursues its own security without regard for others, we create global insecurity that threatens us all. Disarmament, including arms control, non-proliferation, prohibitions, restrictions, confidence building, and where needed, elimination, is an essential tool to secure our world and our future. Mesdames et Messieurs, chers étudiants. We live in a dangerous world. Tension, the cold world, are back with us again, and this in an increasingly complex world. Most of you students at the, city, the University of Geneva weren't even born at the time of the Cold War when the whole world was waiting with bated breath looking at what two superpowers were fighting about. Fortunately, despite a number of near misses and false alarms, we managed to avoid nuclear warfare. We're now moving towards a multipolar world. International relations are more complex and harder to forecast. The mechanism of exchange and dialogue, which in the past helped us appease tension and helped us to see to it that an isolated incident didn't spiral out of control, have lost in terms out in terms of efficacy. Conflicts are increasingly protracted for civilian populations. There are conflicts all over the world, and there are terrorists and organized militias at work. And these groups have a huge arsenal of weapons, including small weapons as well as drones and ballistic weapons. And obviously, they're trying to enhance this arsenal. Military expenditure is on the up, and um, there is a nuclear weapons race on, especially in the most dangerous regions of the world. Last year, military expenditure exceeded $17 trillion, a record sum since the fall of the Berlin War. This is around 80 times the amount needed for global humanitarian aid. Chemical weapons have returned. Divisions in, in the international community have prevented action against them. Devastating high explosives designed for the battlefield are being used in cities. And artificial intelligence and autonomous systems are enabling new weapons that challenge existing laws and conventions. Meanwhile, efforts to end poverty, advance health and education, fight climate change, and protect our planet are starved of resources. This is the backdrop of my agenda for disarmament. Ladies and gentlemen, my agenda has three priorities. Disarmament to save humanity, disarmament to save lives, and disarmament for future generations. First, disarmament to save humanity, aiming to reduce and eliminate weapons of mass destruction, nuclear, chemical, and biological. The total elimination of nuclear weapons is in the DNA of the United Nations. Indeed, it was the subject of the very first resolution adopted by the General Assembly in 1946. And today, the total elimination of nuclear weapons remains our priority, to which I reaffirm my commitment. But efforts to achieve this goal are in state of severe crisis. Our world is going backwards. Throughout and immediately after the Cold War, it was possible, through difficult negotiations, 
to yield agreements that reduced arsenals, outlawed, outlawed nuclear testing, and dismantled whole categories of missiles. Communication channels enhanced, at the time, transparency, built confidence, and reduced risks. Three ex-Soviet states, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine, repatriated nuclear weapons in their possession. South Africa unilaterally dismantled its nuclear arsenal, and other states took important positive steps. World leaders at the time were fluent in the language and logic of arms control, and they understood that it was integral to security. But the agreements of that era are now threatened as never before. Strategic dialogue between the nuclear weapon states remains today limited. There are no bilateral negotiations underway between Russia and the United States for further nuclear arms reductions. Governments are pouring resources into updating old weapon systems, developing new ones, and entering into what many see as a new arms race based on quality rather than quantity. Some 15,000 nuclear weapons remain stockpiled around the world. Hundreds are ready to be launched within minutes. We are one mechanical, electronic, or human error away from a catastrophe that could eradicate entire cities from the map. We all agree that the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is central to the maintenance of international peace and security. This landmark treaty, which is nearly 50 years old, has successfully limited the number of states that possess nuclear weapons to less than 10. Its safeguards regime provides assurance of the exclusively peace nature of civil nuclear programs. But beyond that, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is also essential to preserving an environment conducive to disarmament. Non-proliferation and disarmament are two sides of the same coin. Together, they constitute a reciprocal legal arrangement between the nuclear and the non-nuclear states. Reversal on one side will lead to reversal on the other, and we have reasons to fear the risks in relation to the Non-Proliferation Treaty today. I appeal to all states, including non-parties, to adhere to the Non-Proliferation and Disarmament Obligations and Commitments under the NPT. All states, nuclear and non-nuclear, must work together to bridge the gulf that divides them. Some characterize the difference as a choice between humanitarian and security concerns, but that is a false dichotomy. Human security, national security, and global security are indivisible. When people fear for their lives, their communities, societies, and countries are at increased risk. When people enjoy safety, so do their countries and the world. The Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, adopted last year and central in the awarding of the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize, demonstrated strong international support for a permanent end to the threat posed by nuclear arms. And it was also a call to break the stalemate in nuclear disarmament negotiations. Dear students, ladies and gentlemen, the states that possess nuclear weapons have primary responsibility. They must prevent the use of nuclear weapons, reduce the danger of nuclear war, and lead efforts on non-proliferation and disarmament. And this must start with meeting their existing obligations with concrete benchmarks and timelines. And some of these are decades overdue. I appeal to the Russian Federation and the United States to resolve their dispute over the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, to extend the New START Treaty on Strategic Offensive Arms, which is due to expire in just three years, and to take new steps towards reducing nuclear stockpiles. Together with other states that possess nuclear weapons, they should urgently renew efforts towards reducing the dangers posed by these weapons by taking concrete action in a number of key areas. And here I will quote from the text of my disarmament agenda published today. 
These areas include reductions in overall stockpiles of all types of nuclear weapons, ensuring the non-use of nuclear weapons, reduction of the role and significance of nuclear weapons in military concepts, doctrines, and policies, reductions in the operational readiness of nuclear weapon systems, constraints on the development of advanced new types of nuclear weapons, increased transparency in nuclear weapons programs, and measures to build confidence and mutual trust. End of quote. I will do everything I can to support these efforts. Through their policies and actions, every government should work to ensure that the 72-year practice of non-use of nuclear weapons continues indefinitely and is universally understood to be an inviolable, inviolable no. The same should be true of the norm against nuclear testing. By constraining the development of new types of weapons, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty put a break on the arms race. With the exception of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, all governments have upheld the moratorium on nuclear tests for the past two decades. Since 1996, when the treaty opened for signature, the international community has responded to all violations of this norm, and the Security Council adopted a resolution to support the treaty in 2016. I appealed for states that have not yet done so to join the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty without delay. We need to preserve the valuable gains we have made, even as we forge new understandings and new agreements. Dialogue and negotiations are the only way forward and must guide our efforts. And I work directly with member states to facilitate dialogue among governments, including through the creation of informal platforms to explore new approaches and measures to reduce risks and to build confidence. We will redouble our work with experts at the technical level to develop practical measures to pave the world for a world free of nuclear weapons. And this should include further partial measures for disarmament, from strengthening and consolidating nuclear weapon-free zones, to ending the production of nuclear material for weapons, limiting strategic nuclear delivery systems, and agreeing on approaches to verify disarmament. Let us all work together to bring new urgency to achieve the universal goal of a nuclear weapon-free world. Dear students, ladies and gentlemen, we will also take steps to end and prevent the use of other weapons of mass destruction, especially chemical weapons. Since 2014, the fact-finding mission of the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons has examined 83 incidents involving the alleged use of chemical weapons in Syria. Investigators have said chemical weapons were used or were more than likely to have been used in 14 cases so far. Each use is a crime under international law, and their widespread use may also constitute a crime against humanity. The Security Council has failed to meet its responsibility to ensure accountability for these attacks. And I'm working with the members of the Security Council to build new leadership and unity to restore shared ownership and respect for the global ban on chemical weapons. These must include the creation of a new and impartial mechanism to identify those who use them. We cannot allow continued impunity in Syria or elsewhere. And I will also support to strengthen the Chemical Weapons Convention and its institutional capacity to ensure the full implementation of the landmark disarmament treaty. We will never accept the possession or use of chemical weapons. We must also do more to increase our ability to uphold the ban on biological weapons. Concerns around these weapons continue to grow as developments in science and technology make them easier to develop and use. But there is currently no organization on inspectorate or inspectorate body supporting the Biological Weapons Convention. I will therefore work with member states to establish a core standing mechanism to conduct investigations into any alleged use of these weapons based on the authority given to me. 
And I will also explore long-term solutions, including strengthening the institutional capacity of the Biological Weapons Convention. Strengthening the norms and conventions against chemical and biological weapons is in the interests of all humanity. These weapons are banned and they should never be used. Dear students, ladies and gentlemen, my second priority is disarmament that saves lives by reducing and mitigating the impact of conventional weapons. The widespread availability of these weapons, from improvised explosive devices to ballistic missiles, rockets, artillery, and illicit handguns, contributes to the armed violence that is causing chaos in many parts of the world. Military industries are producing ever more weapons. The arms trade is seeking ever-expanding markets. Countries are building up massive stockpiles of conventional arms, especially in the most conflict-prone regions of the world. And we must counter these destabilizing trends. We have already seen how the prohibition and restriction of some conventional weapons can save and improve lives. Anti-personal landmines and class ammunitions have been banned for years. And the Arms Trade Treaty that regulates the sale of weapons on humanitarian grounds came into force in 2014. But despite these achievements, civilians continue, continue to bear the brunt of armed conflict. Beyond the appalling numbers of civilians killed and injured, conflicts are driving record numbers of people from their homes, often depriving them of food, health care, education, and any means of making a living. At the end of 2016, more than 65 million people were uprooted by war, violence, and persecution. As armed conflict has moved from open fields into cities, explosive weapons are particularly deadly for civilians. When explosive weapons are used in urban areas, some 90% of the casualties are civilians. And these weapons also have a devastating effect on hospitals, schools, and water and electricity supplies. That is why I will support member states in developing appropriate limitations, common standards, and operational policies on the use of these weapons in residential areas. And I will also support the collection of data on civilian casualties. We need more evidence to effect changes to policies, military operational procedures, and behavior, and to create stronger global standards to protect civilians. Dear students, ladies and gentlemen, the United Nations has sought to tackle the widespread availability of illicit small arms and ammunition from many angles. Peace and security, gender equality, sustainable development, transnational crime, counterterrorism, and humanitarian action. United Nations peacekeepers often work on disarmament programs around the world, and they are an integral part of our work on sustaining peace. But our work has been spread across 20 different agencies. It is fragmented and limited. I am therefore launching a new initiative to combat the illicit circulation and trade in small arms at the national level and across borders. I will dedicate resources within the Peacebuilding Fund to support government action on illicit small arms and light weapons, including collection and destruction and the development of legal and policy frameworks. United Nations peacekeepers work on disarmament programs around the world. My initiative will have a strong basis also in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the world's blueprint for peace and prosperity on a healthy planet. Excessive spending on weapons drains resources from sustainable development. It is incompatible with creating stable, inclusive societies strong institutions, effective governance and democracy, and the culture of respect for human rights. And there is also a strong gender dimension to this work. Almost universally, guns are infused with masculine characteristics. Men make up the overwhelming majority of the owners and users of firearms. Women are several times more likely to be victims of gun violence than perpetrators. The presence of excessive and unregulated firearms exacerbates gender-based violence and shores up traditional gender roles and power relations. We must prevent a culture of violence and bloodshed 
and the cycle that is difficult to break. Dear students, ladies and gentlemen, my third priority is disarmament for future generations. Advances in science and technology are transforming many aspects of our lives for the better. Technological progress has increased trade and prosperity and improved living conditions in many parts of the world. Technologies including big data and analytics, artificial intelligence and automation should help us to combat and mitigate the impact of climate change, to protect our environment, and to create conditions for growth and development that benefit everyone. But many of these developments are also enabling new weapon technologies with dangerous and repugnant applications. They could open a new battlefield or start a new arms race. Some developments could challenge existing legal, humanitarian and ethical norms. The prospect of autonomous weapons has already generated considerable public anxiety. Human beings must remain in control of the use of force at all times. Some, like armed drones, could challenge long-standing interpretations of international law. We need common standards to promote accountability, transparency and oversight. Some, like advances in gene editing and synthetic biology, could enable new types of biological warfare, making these prohibited weapons easier to use. There is another reason to increase the capacity of the Biological Weapons Convention and its instruments. The continued development of hypersonic, ballistic missiles and space-based weapons could create new threats to security and add new complications to nuclear disarmament. Meanwhile, the malicious use of cyberspace is growing and its impacts are becoming more widespread. If uh, there is a major outbreak of armed conflict in our world, and we all hope there is not, I am sure that it would be preceded by a massive cyber attack. And there is consensus that international law, including the United Nations Charter, applies to cyberspace. However, there is a lack of consensus about precisely how international law applies and how states may respond to malicious or hostile acts within the law. Cyber attacks or critical infrastructure could have serious consequences for international relations, peace and security. We could even face the creation of a cyber weapons of mass destruction. The combined risks of new weapons technologies could have a game-changing impact on our future security. Our joint disarmament efforts in this area must have a game-changing preventive impact. And there are many things we can do together. Governments can improve oversight, transparency and accountability. All states have a responsibility to determine whether new weapons they seek would be prohibited under international law. And I'm prepared to make available my good offices to prevent conflict resulting from acts committed in cyberspace. And I will support member states to elaborate new measures including legally binding agreements to make sure human beings control the use of force at all times. I will bring together scientists and engineers who commit to developing science and technology for peaceful purposes. We urgently need their insights. And I will explore opportunities for encouraging responsible innovation by the private sector. I urge governments to continue to explore multilateral measures for prevention and control. Dear students, ladies and gentlemen, we cannot create a safer world for all through uncoordinated action. Disarmament works best when we work together, governments, experts, civil society and the individuals. As our expectations for disarmament evolve, so must these partnerships. Let us look at our principal multilateral forum, the Conference on Disarmament and Disarmament Commission. Both will soon be 40 years old, and both have produced very little for the last half of their lifetimes. It is past time to revigorate them. They will require improved coordination, an end to duplication, better use of expertise, and above all, political courage to shift positions. I intend to work with member states and to investigate possible ways to achieve this. One way forward is to open them up to new voices 
and make them as inclusive and diverse as possible. Women have a leading role to play in all our work for global peace and security. Several women have been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for their role in achieving landmark disarmament treaties and in mobilizing global public opinion. Women must participate as decision makers in all disarmament processes, and I am totally committed to doing all I can to support this. And young people, like the students present in this room, are the most important force for change in our world. I hope you'll use your voices to make a difference from, going your, from giving your time and energy to causes that matter to you, to advocating and standing up for what you know is right. You have opportunities to act locally, to volunteer and to work through civil society organizations. And social media offers unprecedented tools to connect, to reach across borders, and join with others around the world through campaigns, non-governmental organizations, and online communities. The United Nations would like to work with you to help you acquire the knowledge and skills to amplify your voices and lead the change we need. I hope you will use your power and your connections to advocate for a peaceful world free from nuclear weapons, in which weapons are controlled and regulated and resources are directed towards opportunity and prosperity for all. The United Nations was created with the goal of eliminating war as an instrument of foreign policy. But seven decades on, our world is as dangerous as it has ever been. Disarmament prevents and ends violence. Disarmament supports sustainable development. And disarmament is true to our values and principles. That is why I am presenting this agenda for disarmament here today. I urge all to step up, and I thank you for your attention and look forward for our discussion. Thank you very much. Mr. Secretary-General, thank you for these impressive words. This is a very important day in matters of international relations. I now invite Mrs. Calmiré, former president of the Swiss Federation, to come to the rostrum and sit next to Mr. Gutierrez. I would also like to invite Mrs. Ronak and Asani, Mrs. Beatrice Muller, and Mr. Michael Vidal, students of the University of Geneva, to come to the restroom for this Q&A session. Thank you for being here. Monsieur le Secretary. Mr. Secretary General, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. It's a great privilege to be here and to be able to congratulate you. Because regarding the recent events, the withdrawal of the uh, United States from the Iranian nuclear deals, what, and what happens in uh, Syria, what happens in Yemen, what happens in Gaza, um, I think you are a very courageous man. Um, if you are looking, we are living in a world where weapons are everywhere. We are living in a world where conflicts are booming, where people are killed. Millions and millions of people are injured and killed. And in this world, you are coming and making an initiative on disarmament. Thank you very much. I think we have to thank you and congratulate you. And you come. Yeah, bravo. And you are here in Geneva. In Geneva, there is an institution who got a mandate to negotiate on disarmament question. And this uh, is the commission on disarmament. And this commission have done a work, have done in 1992, uh, the Chemical Weapons Convention, 1996, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. But this commission was blocked during 20 years. Now, since last year, 
it moved a little, little, little bit. That's, I have to say, is either a good news. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Monsieur le Secrétaire Général, peut-être certain. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Secretary General, perhaps you're asking yourselves what we're doing here, myself and my students. We are honored indeed to be sitting next to the Secretary General of the United Nations. Every year, I organize a seminar that is on the art and science of negotiation, and we look at matters of disarmament, and in particular, nuclear disarmament. In 2015, we were uh, happy indeed to uh, do a simulation on the treaty banning the production of fissile matter for use in nuclear weapons. We analyzed the reasons for the blocking of the Disarmament Commission and uh, simulated the negotiation on this treaty. I have the honor to hand you a copy of the debriefing of this simulation. So, E.H. Zurich uh, and of the um, uh, Moscow Institute for International Relations, we are preparing a simulation on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, so I think it's, for, for the students and for me, it is something very, not only interesting, but I mean, it put us in a situation where we can see how the world is going on. It's not very funny, I have to say. But my students are now very eager to put you some questions. They prepared some questions. So I give the floor to, first of all, to Mikkel. Thank you very much, um, Secretary General, for being here and for answering questions from students like us. Um, as you mentioned in your speech, the Conference on Disarmament has remained paralyzed due to the rule of consensus for over 20 years. Does the UN have any plan to start a process uh, that would look into ways to reform this Conference on Disarmament? I think the central problem is not the problem of reform, even if I believe that, uh, as I said, to, to open the dialogue, to be more inclusive, to have other entities having an influence on the dialogue uh, is essential. But I think the, the central question is political will. And what we have had in the last 20 years, as it was said, was lack, lack of political will, and largely due to lack of confidence and trust. We live in a world where the confidence and trust between the general public and the institutions, national institutions and international institutions, and between countries is as low as ever that I remember from the past. And what I think the United Nations needs to do is to create the conditions to increase trust and to make people understand, especially to make governments understand, that this paralysis is undermining their own security. And it's in the interest of everybody to move forward. Now, there was, as uh, um, uh, Madame Calmire explained, some movement. Um, some working groups were created, and for the first time in 20 years, some substance is being discussed. But we are far from a true negotiation platform. And I think what we need is to move towards a true negotiation platform. And there are many areas that can be covered by that. And we'll be putting as much pressure as possible in member states to move in that direction. And I appeal for everybody at the level of the civil society, at the level of public opinion, to do everything possible to make governments understand that this paralysis, if you look at the risks that are now appearing, the risks of non-proliferation in relation to nuclear weapons. Uh, JCPOA, the, today's news about uh, 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 North Korea. Uh, the, the, the dramatic risks of, uh, 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 of non-proliferation of chemical weapons. Chemical weapons now are being used, I mean, and it becomes almost a new normal. So it's in the interest of everybody to stop this trend, because it's our collective security that is being put at risk. Beatrice? Thank you. Um, my question is the following. Um, explosive weapons in populated areas are a major cause of civilian casualties in today's conflict. Um, it is unlikely that this armament can be extended to all weapons belonging to the category of explosive weapons, which in turn are likely to be used in densely populated areas. Um, what can be done to face this humanitarian challenge? Well, first of all, explosive weapons were designed for the battlefield, not for urban warfare. Uh, and obviously, 
uh, th there are no disarmament agreements in relation to uh, uh, those weapons that are being used. But it is clear under international humanitarian law that they cannot be used systematically against civilians. So the use of this kind of weapons systematically against civilians, and as I said, 90% of the casualties in urban warfare are today civilians, the use of this kind of weapons against civilians is clearly a violation of international humanitarian law. And I think it's necessary for member states to make an effort to create a number of norms and a number of principles in relation to the use of these weapons. There is some progress. There are two examples that I think are quite interesting. Uh, one is the African Union in Somalia. They adopted a code of conduct on these issues that is quite an advancement coming from Somalia. Can you imagine uh, and an example given by the African Union? The other is in Afghanistan, of the international forces that have indeed taken a number of measures to uh, make sure that uh, these weapons are not used in the circumstances that I was mentioning. So, we have not a prohibition of these weapons, we have not a disarmament mechanism, but we have international humanitarian law. And we need to be uh, effective in making sure that violations of international humanitarian law are taken, are taken seriously by the international community. And uh, there are crimes that are committed, those crimes should be obviously prosecuted. Uh, uh, there is a, respons a particular responsibility of the Security Council. It's true that we know that the Security Council has been very reluctant in recent times, for instance, in referring cases to the International Criminal Court. So, so there are many problems that we are facing, many difficulties for this lack of trust, for this lack of confidence. But uh, this is for us, uh, when uh, disarmament is not only about nuclear weapons. And disarmament that saves lives is crucial and the, the central part of the disarmament that saves lives for me is exactly the use of explosive weapons in urban warfare contexts. Um, you kind of already answered to this question through your discourse and uh, your explana explanation of the second priority. But my question is about the civ Syrian civil war, which is a very sad practical example of the weakness of some of our legal instruments in the field of disarmament. And since 2011, state parties to the Chemical Weapons Convention have been accused of having used chemical weapons in Syria and that more than once. And as you mentioned, the UN Security Council has a big responsibility in this convention. And my question is, do you see anything that the UN can do specifically in the case of Syria to ensure that the violations are proper, pro properly investigated and that the ban on the use of chemical weapons uh, is really enforced? Well, first of all, I think it's very important to underline what you said. Explosive weapons used in urban warfare, uh, those weapons are allowed. They are being used in a context where they should not be used but chemical weapons are banned in all circumstances. The possession and use of chemical weapons is banned. And so, obviously, uh, its use is a war crime, and its massive use can be a crime against humanity. Um, we had a serious problem in relation to Syria because there, was, uh, there were two mechanisms that were in place. One is a fact-finding mission of the Organization of Prohibition of Capital Weapon, Chemical Weapons. That fact-finding mission has identified the number of situations in which chemical weapons have been used. But the mandate that was given to that fact-finding mission did not allow it to attribute responsibilities. And so another mechanism was created by the Security Council called the GIM, Joint Inspection Mechanism, that was able to attribute responsibilities in relation to a limited number of situations. In some cases, responsibilities of the government of Syria. In some cases, responsibilities of terrorist organizations. The point is that that has created a huge division in the Security Council. So the mandate of this joint inspection mechanism has not been renewed. And until now, all attempts to create a mechanism to replace it have failed, with vetoes that have not allowed it to move forward. I have not lost hope that it would be possible to find a compromise and to make sure that we have a mechanism to attribute responsibilities in relation of chemical weapons, because we need to end impunity. 
The problem is, if there's no attribution of responsibility, there is total impunity. And in something that is banned, independently of the horrible impact that it has on people, and we have all seen the terrible images, uh, I mean, but it's banned. And so it is a dramatic failure of the international community not to be able to implement something that is clearly, the, 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 the end of something that is clearly banned. Now, there are other mechanisms that are possible. Um, uh, and uh, I know member states uh, have been considering those other possible mechanisms uh, in the context of the uh, organization of uh, uh, prohibition of chemical weapons, in the context of other bodies of the UN. But I still believe that uh, the best solution would be to create the conditions for the Security Council to fully assume their responsibilities in relation to this. I would say that one of the dramatic problems we have in today's world is the failure to have consensus in the Security Council in relation to things that should be uniting everybody. You have a second question? Yeah, maybe I can. <coughs> My second question is in French, if it's, if it's okay for you. In French. In French. Oh, yeah. um, Currently, most of armed conflicts are extended. We have many examples of this. For instance, the Congo Democratic Republic, Yemen, Syria, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan. The availability of light weapons and small weapons obviously make these uh, conflicts protracted. More than 14 billions of munitions are manufactured every year. We're talking about a lethal capacity of twice the world population. Moreover, 85% of the illicit trafficking of weapons is based on legal contracts that have been duly signed. So my question is as follows. How are you going to deal with this problem? How can the United Nations really rise to this enormous challenge, this huge challenge? Well, it's, I don't think it's not only the United Nations. It obviously depends widely on uh, member states and uh, existing instruments, but it's not easy to implement, I know. But if I may, uh, as a preliminary consideration, prevention is better than cure, and we need to prevent conflicts, and the capacity to solve, to settle conflicts is another very important element, and this is something that has been cruelly lacking um, in more recent times, and that is why our top priority, and the top priority of all that I undertake today within the United Nations is to do with prevention. We want to do our utmost to avoid new conflicts breaking out. And at the same time, we're doing our very best. There are all sorts of important initiatives that have been taken to put a stop to the conflict in Syria, in Yemen. It's a bit more complicated. So prevention and settlement of conflicts, peaceful settlement of conflicts. It's the lack of prevention, the lack of conflict resolution, which leads to this massive use of small and light weapons that you've alluded to. Secondly, there are mechanisms in place that we may use, for instance, armed weapons embargoes, uh, sanctions that may apply. And we have checked quite recently that it was difficult for the Security Council to shoulder its responsibilities and implement these measures. There have been unilateral actions that have been taken, but the, the Security Council should show greater firmness in this matter. Then there's a treaty on the arms trade, and this treaty needs to be properly implemented. Now, there are all sorts of things that we can do in various areas. And I see our role at the United Nations Secretariat. We're trying to get all those involved to do something in all these areas to try and reduce this tragedy, which is this massive use of all these weapons with these devastating consequences. And then there's the other matter, uh, political matter. As soon as uh, armament budgets 
are increased. And when you look at the investments in this area, obviously, uh, when you have weapons that are available, then obviously you tend to use them, even if there's a lot of trafficking ongoing based on legal contracts, as you say quite rightly, unfortunately. A second question, if I may, in French. In your presentation, you talked about the objective of doing away with the nuclear weapons. Do you think that the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons is an effective mechanism of nuclear disarmament? And do you think is it, it is compatible with the um, PNT? And what is the role that the United Nations could play? Of course, it is in completely compatible with the treaty on non-proliferation and disarmament. They go hand in hand. They work hand in hand. And this paralysis of the disarmament mechanisms is what makes it more difficult for non-proliferation to take place. So both mechanisms need to work together. They are compatible. They need to work hand in hand. It's a very important treaty, and you're going to say that I am totally naive in this matter. Nuclear weapons are not going to disappear overnight, and therefore this treaty is very difficult to implement when it comes to its final overreaching objective. But this treaty is an affirmation of a huge frustration and the expression of will of increasing number of countries to say enough is enough. And the fact that this treaty was approved is an extraordinary factor because it means that those that who don't agree with the treaty have come to understand that something needs to be done. And I think that this treaty has given increased momentum to other mechanisms of disarmament, which is perhaps more limited in scope, but just as essential. So I think it's very easy to level criticism at this treaty, but it's not at all justified. I think it's a very important instrument that has a direct impact and also a huge indirect impact, which needs to be noted. Thank you. First, I'm following a course on the DPRK and the potential denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Thus, we know that a solid verification regime is of paramount importance. Since the United States had the UN mandate in the Korean War, it would be logical, it would be natural for the UN to have a role in the verification system. So my question is, how can we get the verification system to be multilateral, and how can we involve the UN in it? Well, first, the UN has been doing several things. And for instance, as you probably know, uh, before all these events took place, uh, I've sent the Under Secretary General of uh, Political Affairs to Pyongyang exactly to put pressure to see if we could unblock a situation that was looking like we would be moving into uh, the kind of war that could have devastating consequences. So there are a number of areas in good offices in which the UN can do things. And I went to Pyeongchang myself to talk with both uh, Koreas. And so there are things we can do. Now, there is no institutional instrument for uh, the, the managing the disarmament and verifying the disarmament. We have the International Agency of Atomic Energy, but the International Agency of Atomic Energy uh, is essentially to guarantee that uh, the uh, nuclear uh, capacity in the countries uh, is verified and is used for peaceful purposes. It's not a disarmament mechanism. And uh, um, in relation to the uh, 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 nuclear test uh, ban treaty, uh, as you know, North Korea has not yet signed it. Uh, of course, it, there is a number of things that can be done, but it's again not an instrument of disarmament, which means that the verification of a, disarm, a nuclear disarmament process like this one will depend largely on the will of the parties. Having said so, we are ready to cooperate 
in all possible forms to support the success of a mechanism that I hope, or a process that I hope, that uh, the recent news do not uh, mean that uh, will not move forward. And uh, uh, if I have a message to to all the parties on this is nerves of steel, and let's continue with the efforts to find a path for the peaceful nuclearization, the nuclearization, and the rarefied the nuclearization of the uh, Korean Peninsula. But the role uh, that the United Nations or its different uh, agencies can have largely depends on the will of the parties. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. I think we are at the end of the questions. Of the, thank you to have taken the time to answer to our question. And as you said, we are living in a dangerous world and something has to be done. So thank you for doing something. And uh, we hope for you great, great success. Thank you very much. Mr. Secretary-General, um, Madam Calmire, dear students, thank you for this very interesting Q&A session. Mr. Antonio Gutierrez, it was an honor indeed to welcome you to the University of Geneva. I'd like to thank all those who came along to be with us this afternoon and all those who followed this event live on the internet. I heard your appeal, Mr. Gutierrez, loud and clear on us to step up to move this very important cause forward. I also noted that there's room for scientific experts to do their bit as well when it comes to nuclear disarmament and peace and security in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, for organizational reasons, I'd ask you to stay in your seats for a few seconds and not leave the room straight away. I would like to thank the representatives of the press. Please leave the room now. I wish you a very pleasant evening and I look forward to meeting you all again in our university. Thank you again for being with us this afternoon. <laughs>